Okay, so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about succession planning. Uh, so landowners, of course, you've spent a lot of time acquiring your property. And I talk to a lot of people that are like, okay, I spent all this time, but I, my children aren't as interested as I was in the property. And so what do we do with the property to actually keep it together and keep it as a tree farm? So a couple of potential barriers. So estate tax used to be an issue. That was the primary thing they asked me to talk about, so I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on that. Uh, management and is gonna be a bigger issue, so I'll spend a little bit more time on that and risk from bad business decisions. So just to get the tax out of the way, uh, you know, we had the Economic Growth Tax Relief Reconciliation Act of 2001, back during President Bush, uh, we kind of made the estate tax go away for one year, then it came back, it was supposed to be a million dollars, but Congress kept doing this one year annual extension sort of thing. So finally, at the end of 2012, uh, it's actually signed in January of 2013, we got some permanent tax relief. So the amount that you can transfer tax-free is $5 million in 2011 index for inflation. So this year it's 5450 So it goes up significantly every year because we're talking about a big amount. And so if we're talking about a husband and wife, basically until you get to $10.9 million, you don't really care about the state tax. But of course, if you're worth more than $10.9 million, there are still ways to reduce or minimize the tax you might owe. I'll mention that in just a minute. Uh, the tax rate's now 40%. Portability is a really big issue. Uh, some of you may have a, an old estate plan where we had a credit shelter trust and a marital deduction trust, and they, the attorney maybe talked to you about equalizing the estate size to minimize the tax rate. Now we have this thing called portability, so we don't need to worry about all that stuff anymore. By the way, wives, uh, you might want to go home and check your estate plan, because husbands usually die first. If you got one of these old plans that says marital deduction and credit shelter, back when the, we were talking about a million dollars, there was going to be a million in the credit shelter, the rest was going to be in the marital deduction trust, and you would have had something. Now that it's five million, the entire estate may be in the credit shelter trust. There won't be anything in the marital deduction trust unless you are worth more than five and a half million dollars. And since the marital deduction trust was for the wife, wives, you know, you might want to go check just to see what it looks like. Okay, but portability. What that basically means is, if one spouse dies and they don't use their whole five million then you can actually file a return and save the rest of it. In other words, spouse dies with $2 million, they got another three that they could have used, you file a return. The second spouse to die then has their five plus the three from the first one, so you got eight million. Okay, the other big thing that you need to think about uh, is basis step up. So in case you're not that familiar with it, you know, uh, you buy stock for 60, you sell it for 100, your gain is 40, that's what you pay tax on. Uh, I meet an awful lot of people that don't know what their basis is in their land and their timber. One of those big things you need to establish. One of the nice ways to do it is to inherit it. Because if you inherit it, you basically get fair market value date of death as your basis which basically wipes out all the built-in capital gain that may have been in there. You know, parents bought the land back when it was $200 an acre, now it's worth 15. And if you sold it, you would pay tax on $1,300 an acre. Take it from an estate, your basis is the 15, you pay no tax at that point. Okay, so I mentioned the portability. Uh, there still are some cases where you might want to think about the credit children's marital deduction. Uh, put this slide up there. So if you do have a uh, taxable estate, 
Basically, the idea is that if you die with too many toys, the IRS is going to share with you. So the idea is to have a gifting program so that if you happen to be worth more than $10.9 million, you start transferring assets to the next generation. And there are several tax-free ways to do that. Uh, unless somebody gets really interested, I'll talk about it at lunch or something. Uh, I, I get real, I can get carried away on this because I teach a 15-week estate planning class. That's three hours a week for 15 weeks. So I can talk about this for quite a while, but I want to talk about something else. Okay, so property management is probably a bigger problem even than estate tax. So what typically happens, so I'll just give you a couple of stories. Uh, parents had five children. Uh, they leave everything to their children, but one of the children's died. And the person that died left two grandchildren. And the children remember the old home place. They want to keep it together. But one of the granddaughters, who of course was not reared in the house, doesn't really care about the place. What does she want? Uh, money. Okay, and so what ends up happening is in this particular case, of course, she wants money. So an owner, no matter how small an interest, has a statutory right to have the property partitioned. Okay, so I'm going to back up. Most every, the most typical will is all of my spouse if they survive, otherwise equally to my children. So, so you got 300 acres and you got three children, and so your will says to my children equally, how many acres does each child have? The answer is 300. Okay, so when you said equally to my children, what you did was give each of your children an equal interest in 300 acres. So until you survey it and have a legal description and say, this 100 acres is yours, that is the only way you give a specific piece of property to an individual. And very few people I talk to have done that. So almost everybody, it's to my children equally. So now we've got three children. They all have an equal interest in the 300 acres. So here's another horror story. Uh, this, there were three children in this case. And they inherited the recreational property that was just south of town. And they liked to use it on the weekends in the summer. It got a nice pond on it. And of course, they spend time out there in the winter too. But guess what one of them does? One of the children leased his interest to the hunting club. How many acres did he have the right to? 300. And so now we're looking at two of the children want to take their families out on the weekend, but the hunting club's out there. And so, oh man, there's a little bit of conflict. And I've seen that more than once, by the way. Okay, and so how do we manage the property so we don't run into situations like that. And so I mentioned partition. So when you do this to my children equally and they have this undivided interest in the property, you know, the biggest problem, the most typical one is we can't agree. You know, one wants one wants to graze cattle, one wants to plant crops, somebody else wants to grow timber, somebody else wants to sell the whole thing. And so you spent years acquiring this property. You know, 100 acres here, 50 acres there. And now you're in a situation where what are the children going to do with it? And the problem is, you know, maybe your children aren't that interested in it, but you got grandchildren that are interested. But anybody that has any interest in the property, and of course where a lot of people lost property was, you know, 
I find some guy that's got a one thirtieth interest. You know, two generations down, several children removed. And so I find a guy that's got a one thirtieth interest. And he's never even been seen the property. He lives out of state. I found him because I did some research in the tax records. Found the guy. Hey, I'll give you a thousand bucks for your one thirtieth interest. He's like, it's better than nothing. So he sells it to me. What do I do? Man, I, sell, I sue for petition because my whole goal was to buy the property. And the first priority when you sue for petition is to physically divide the property. So going back to that first family I mentioned, 40 acres, there was a house, there was a pond, there was some pasture, there were some trees. No way to divide that into five different pieces, and one of those pieces has got to be divided in half for the two grandchildren. They all have to have access to a public road. And so the more people that are involved and the more varied the topography, the less chance you're going to physically divide it. But what can we always divide? Bloody. And so what ends up happening, that child of a super division is actually forcing the sale of the property happens fairly often. Okay, now, as a family member, you have a right to buy it before it goes to public sale. Okay, but why don't we just avoid the problem in the first place? Okay, and so what I want to do is spend a couple of minutes talking about using either a business entity or a trust to actually hold the property Okay, so what we're trying to do with this is prevent the partition. We're trying to prevent the conflict that comes from having multiple people have to try to deal with the property. So I can't spend a whole lot of time on this. Through this up, these are the business entities that are available in the state of Alabama. Uh, most of the time we talk about uh, for purposes of holding land for estate planning. We either talk about this uh, this thing that I keep trying to point to that's not on there. <laughs> uh, anyway, a limited liability company, an LLC, which everybody's heard of, and a limited liability limited partnership, which evidently didn't make the slide. <laughs> um, and, and the reason I'm kind of laughing about that because I do more of those now than they. So LLC used to be the popular. No, no uh, number two, uh, one of the big issues is liability. Okay, uh, so you and your brother inherited some property and you've decided that you into this prescribed burning class and you're ready to clean the property up. I mean, how hard is it to get a drip torch and walk around, right? And so there's no need to hire a forester or a burn manager or anything like that. We can walk around with a drip torch. Let's say, I oh, know the wind's blowing this way, we'll start over here. And <coughs> next thing you know, your neighbors, we cleaned it up all right. And the neighbor and the one beside him, who's liable for that? And you say, oh, well, it was my brother that did it. It wasn't me. But guess what? Two people associate together with the intent to earn income. By default, in the state of Alabama, you are a general partnership. If you are a general partnership, you are jointly and severally liable for all debts of the partnership. So even though you didn't file anything, you are a partnership. And because your brother burned up your neighbor's timber, even though it was him, because you were in a general partnership, you are liable. And so, and by the way, when we say liable, that means not only your land, but your house, your car, basically everything you can get except for what you get protected in bankruptcy. 
So hopefully you've either got a lot of insurance or you're not a general partnership. Okay, and so that second thing, a registered limited liability partnership, almost nobody does this, but you can register your general partnership and limit your liability. Uh, it's only good for one year though, then you gotta re-register. So it's kind of a dumb thing to do when you can form an LLC. Uh, so which business entity should you actually pick? And of course, it depends on what's more important to you. And uh, by the way, I do a series of workshops on this. Uh, hopefully one will come to your neighborhood one day before too long. Uh, we're putting some together. We'll probably be doing eight around the state uh, summer to the end of the year. Uh, and we spend a lot more time talking about these, obviously, and it's a two, two and a half hour workshop, so I can't do the whole thing right here. But limited liability is something everybody wants. And so corporation is your typical, but I generally don't suggest corporations. Uh, the problem is most people don't do what they're supposed to do if they have a corporation. So, you know, you got a corporation, you got to have an annual meeting. Anytime you want to do something, you've got to have a board of directors meeting, which means you got to have a notice before the meeting, you've got to have an agenda, you got to have resolutions, you got to have minutes. All of that's got to be in the corporate book. If you're not doing all that paperwork, you really don't want to be a corporation. If you are a single shareholder corporation, you still have to have all that stuff. I met with myself, and I elected myself president. <laughs> but if it's not in the book, you know, my wife was, was, a, nurse, was a nurse for years, you know. You know they looked at, you know, if it's not in the chart, it didn't happen. Well, it's the same thing with, you know, when we sue you, if you don't have proof, and you're, you're not a very good witness for yourself. So it needs to be in right Anyway. So limited liability, which generally means a limited liability company. Uh, by the way, that thing that I didn't put up there, there was a limited partnership. Uh, participation in management is one of the big things we're looking at. So with a limited partnership, you have one or more general partners and one or more limited partners. The general partners run the business, no matter how small their interest. So the advantage with a limited partnership, you can have one limited partner unit, or excuse me, one general partner unit and 99 limited partner units, and that one general partner unit controls the business, period. Okay, and so as parents, you know, it's usually two and 98. And so mom and dad are the general partners, which means they got 100% control of the business with the idea that when something happens to them, they will give that general partnership interest to their child who had an interest in the property. And that child will be able to manage the property. The other children will be limited partners, which means they get to share in the income. But that general partner doesn't have to have a family meeting and vote on what we're gonna do. The general partner makes the decisions. And so if you are a limited liability company, you set it up to be run by managers. And so you can do about the same thing with a LLC. The problem is if you give away too much interest, then they can vote you out of your management spot. Uh, there are several other advantages that I won't have time to talk about. Uh, <coughs> So, using a business entity, we talked about limiting liability, so we'll set that up, of course. We're maintaining control because we're either managers or we're general partners. One of the other big issues is if you give your child an interest in the business, remember we are trying to avoid this petition, can they force you to buy them out? And again, if you form the limited partnership, or, and I'm going to say limited partnership, but what I mean is a limited liability, limited partnership, triple LP. 
So with a triple LP, the limited partners don't have a right to get out. With an LLC, you can get out, but you can't take any money with you. And so, again, we're, we've got limited withdrawal rights. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is if you have an LLC, you basically have to allow the transfer of that interest. So that's one small issue there. Same thing with a limited partnership interest. Uh, all they can transfer, though, is their right to income. Uh, one of the other things we get with this is creditor protection. So once we have that in the business entity, basically your children can't get sued out of the property. Uh, you do have to be careful about they can mortgage the property and lose it. Uh, and I'm about to run out of time, so let me say something about a trust. One of the problems with the business entity, who controls the business after you're gone? That would be your children, right? So if your whole point was to keep your children from selling the property, and you put it in a business entity, and now they have the control of the business, they can sell the property. So an alternative is to put it in a trust, okay? And the trust has basically all of the advantages of the business entity, plus a few more. Uh, the one thing it doesn't have is perpetual life. So a business could be perpetual, a trust, they're basically controlled by the rule against perpetuities. Alabama changed its rule against perpetuities about a year and a half ago. So now in Alabama, you can run a trust that holds land if you set it up correctly for a measly 360 years. Okay, and so with a trust, uh, should I talk quickly about a trust? So uh, trust, you're the grantor. So you write the trust. You're the one that says, okay, here's how we're setting this thing up. You're the one that puts the stuff in it. You are probably also the initial trustee. So the trustee is basically going to be the person that runs everything. They have legal title to the property and the trust, but there are beneficiaries who have equitable title. So the trustee cannot use trust assets for his own benefit. Okay, so now we've got the children, they are getting the benefit. And so you've told the trustee, hire a consulting forester, develop a sustainable management plan. We only cut trees when the management plan says we cut trees. And so children can't force you to clear cut the property. You've got creditor protection because the children don't actually own anything. They have a right to income from the trust, but they don't own the property, so they can't mortgage it. They can't be sued out of it. They can't be divorced out of it. And not only that, but with the trust, you can set up how the money gets distributed. So I hate to say it, but a lot of the people I talk to worked hard for their money. They don't want their children to just sit around and live off the trust. So they put things in there like, match my child's earned income, 50 cents on the dollar if they got a college degree, 25 cents on the dollar if they don't. <laughs> and so you can basically, so we, we set up the investments uh, and, uh, you know, like I got one guy that says, okay, in any of the cash invested with a fee-based financial plan or not one of these churn it and make money kind of guys. So, so we got the professional forester managing the property, the dirt and the trees. We got a fee-based financial planner managing the money that's in the trust. And of course, the, the trust says, trustees got to develop a five-year budget, got to hang on to money because you know we don't generate income every year from our timber property. So we got, okay, we got property taxes and all this other stuff. And, and so after the budget, then the money that's left gets to go to the children. But you can put all kinds of stuff on there about how the children get money out of it. Okay. Uh, 
Two minutes? Yes. Two minutes. Okay, so so real quick, so trust can either be revocable or irrevocable. So we almost all or I almost always set up revocable trust. So basically the trust is your estate plan. So while you're alive, you put things in, take things out, you change it. A revocable trust is actually not a separate legal entity. You file your tax return just like you always did. Uh, irrevocable trusts are primarily used for tax planning purposes. Uh, that thing I had up there a minute ago, if you remember, split interest gifting, Cupert's, Gratz, Grutz, Grits, all that junk. Those are irrevocable trusts for tax planning purposes. Uh, you can either do a trust and make it current, or you can use your will to generate a trust. I generally don't use a will because basically what you're doing is saying, run all my stuff through probate, and the probate fee can be up to 5%, so why run all your land through probate when you could have actually put it in your revocable trust right now. And so I generally like what we call inter vivos or living revocable trust. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of the trust, of course, is creditor protection. The children can't sell it, can't be divorced, that sort of thing. And you have control over how you distribute assets. And so you can do things like, you know, if there's an unexpected medical bill, give them some money. You know, when my child gets married, when they buy their first house, you can put all kinds of stuff in a trust. I hate to say it, but one of the things that's fairly popular, test my children for illegal substances three times randomly during the year. If they test positive, no distributions from the trust until they attend an in-house counseling program and pass the test. My child refuses the test, no distributions. So there are all kinds of things that you can do with the trust that to me is gives you a little bit more control than the business entity does. And I'll quit right here because it's always a good idea to quit on time. And I will be around for lunch because I seldom skip a meal. <laughs> and so if anybody wants to chat, I'll be happy to.